So we are here um, at the end of day for the courtroom trial today. Um, after lunch, we had Trey Shilley come in. He is a park service employee that was driving from Las Vegas. He was on a vacation from Las Vegas to Denver, Colorado. He was driving on the road when this happened. He saw it happen. He stopped. He took pictures of people on the bridge. Just for a quick moment, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, he took pictures um, of Eric Prone on the bridge, talking about the fact that his barrel was in between the concrete structure, that he was pointing his rifle towards the wash. Um, he said, did the other men have firearms? I don't recall. He was pointing it towards the fence and the BLM. At this point, we find out in the courtroom that uh, it does not have to be in law enforcement to see and perceive a threat for it to be a crime. So they are using this gentleman as the person that sees Eric Parker pointing his weapon and saying that he is the one that perceives this crime and him perceiving that crime is Eric threatening law enforcement even though this gentleman's not law enforcement, law enforcement didn't know. If this guy perceives a threat of for law enforcement, that means that he's threatened law enforcement. So once again, rules are changing up in the uh, courtroom. In cross-examination, Marchese did a wonderful job. He went in and brought all the pictures. There's maybe eight pictures. He asked if they were in chronological order. He talked about the protesters at the gate. He talked about the man on the bridge um, in prone, that's Eric. He pointed multiple times to the picture and the fact that his finger is not on the trigger. It's not in the little trigger area and he's not on the trigger. Um, he talked about the white hat, black hat, all these tan hats, people with different hats, people that were crouched down, people that didn't have weapons. I believe that he's going towards the uh, aerial footage where they're like, well, here's three people and you can see two are crouched down. He's claiming one is prone. They're, they're proving right here that there were other people crouched. There were other people back there. There are other people in different hats. Um, and then we get to Nazi. You testified you were in fear of law enforcement officers. Talked about how he met with the FBI, but he did not tell them that he was in fear of the uh, law enforcement officers. This was objected to because once again it wasn't a report he wrote himself it was a report the fbi wrote and they can't say you know they can't judge well if the question wasn't asked and then the, and the information wasn't given he met with the u.s attorney's office three times and the fbi four times once again this is um a park service employee from denver colorado i believe a forest service, uh, forest service in employee from denver colorado um, and he is testifying that he saw Eric pointing weapons at um, the law enforcement. Leventhal uh, goes in cross. He spent 35 to 40 minutes in traffic and only um, to about 10 to 15 on the bridge. That he only saw 15 to 20 law enforcement officers. He shows a picture of protesters in the wash and the point where they moved up. He points out, he blows it up and points out that there's people on, on, at the gate. He points in the picture before when the protesters are further back, there's not people at the gate. Then brings up the fact, well, did BLM come up to the gate and that caused the entire crowd to move forward? Um, he wasn't able to answer that. Um, once again, he points the different hats, um, crouched and, and talks about the movement. He shows Nevada Highway Patrol in the, in the gentleman's pictures. And he asks them, if you perceived a threat, why did you not then go down to the Nevada Highway Patrol and let them know about your threat? Instead, you got into your car and continued on to Denver. You didn't call the, the ambulance, so you didn't call 911 and tell them about this threat. You didn't go down to Nevada Highway Patrol. He says, well, because there were so many officers around, he figured everyone already knew. He talked about the aerial officers and figuring that that was law enforcement because they would have access to those type of uh, uses. Um, and redirect, uh, of course, the government always asks if the U.S. attorneys or FBI ever ask them to do anything other than tell the truth. Um, then we go into our jury questions. The first one, did you witness Parker pointing his weapon at a certain person or a general area? It was general area. 
Next question, if you were concerned of, for the safety of the people, why didn't you go to law enforcement on the bridge? So not only in cross-examination, but the jury is also getting on him for this. Um, the next one, did he ask anyone on the bridge why they were there or anything about what was going on? The answer was no. He, the only person he talked to was the friend he showed up with. Next question, did the FBI know you had photos on the bridge? Did you give them to them voluntarily? He uh, told that he worked for the Park Service, gave the Park Service his photos the next business day because he saw it on the news and then they contacted the FBI, so yes, he did give it voluntarily. 42, why didn't you tell law enforcement about the prone guy on the bridge? He assumed everyone had seen what he had seen. The next question, are the defendants being tried together or separately? The judge didn't want to answer this. She said she would give the information at the end, but to not um, leave them in questioning, they're, they are all being tried separately on same counts. You can say if one person did or one person didn't. Um, number 44, did they talk with anyone on the bridge? No, once again, only his friends. So we have two, two jurors that are like, well, you didn't even ask anyone what they were doing there or what was going on. Number, four, number 45, you feared for law enforcement. Did you also fear for yourself? He said yes towards the end of the 10 minutes. They wouldn't let him go into it because obviously it goes into the, the BLM's actions. Um, then we go back into cross again. Leventhal's asking about a fear um, and that how he knew the aerial surveillance was law enforcement. They have access to that. Um, Mar Marchese went into like, you never asked anyone on the bridge what was going on. He asked if he did independent research, how he got to know um, to turn his photos in. He said yes. They didn't let him go into too much about it, but it, it seems that he had seen the similar pictures that was objected to and he couldn't finish that line of um, questioning. Tanasi got up and said, Parker did not point his weapon at you. And he said, no. The only people who pointed weapons were the BLM. That was objected to, he could not finish that answer. The judge, in the first picture, everyone is standing and no one is pointing a gun. Then you see the prone man. After the picture in the wash, the gentleman says. So the judge, once again, is, is trying to clarify things for the prosecution and moving things along. Um, the last trial, the judge, I don't remember the judge asking a single question, maybe, maybe two or three. We've had so many questions from the judge in here, clarifying things for the jury, uh, clarifying things for the prosecution. It's kind of ridiculous. Next, they call Shannon Serena from Nevada Highway Patrol. This gentleman testified last trial. And I am here to call, um, we want to call for the arrest of Shannon Serena for perjury. He has perjured himself on the stand and I ask each and every one of you to call up Nevada Highway Patrol and ask them if it is their policy to have their officers go in and perjure themselves in the courtroom. And here is where his perjury is. He stated that in the morning of the 12th, he was at the Moapa substation. He was there to put up a K-Rail system to help the BLM exit the area. But then his duties changed. His duties changed because he was then put on to go assist officers being held at gunpoint and that he and his crew were to go assist them. This happened at 11 something in the morning. There was no people down there pointing weapons yet. So there is no possible way that he was told that he needed to go assist officers who were being held at gunpoint. That is termed for perjury. And I ask each and every one of you to call and put the pressure on, uh, what is it, Sergeant Shannon Serena from Nevada Highway Patrol. If we don't hold these law enforcement officers to a higher standard than regular everyday citizens, this is not going to stop. We have to hold them to the law just as much as we're held to the law. They cannot go in. This gentleman testified in the last trial. His testimony today has been 100% the opposite of what he was testifying last time. He is now testifying that Todd Engel was pointing his weapon over the barrier. But perjury has to be something serious. Perjury has to be something that you can actually prove. But I can guarantee you that we can prove that there is no way when he left the Moapa substation that he was going to assist officers being held at gunpoint. And that is what he testified today inside the courtroom. And that's what we need to be pushing. So please, everyone, if anyone is out there, you can look up the Nevada Highway Patrol phone number, put it in this uh, live stream. Please call them and ask them if this is policy 
that they allow their officers to go in and perjure themselves in the courtroom. Okay, now I'm going to go into his testimony. So at 11.30.09 a.m., and this is as he's leaving, after he's already been told that he's going to assist officers being held at gunpoint, um, traffic got heavier and he was going. He sees a person in the roadway stopping traffic, walking back and forth through the traffic with an assault rifle. This is news to me. This is new um, to his testimony last time. He had to make a decision to go down the middle of the road because traffic was so thick he couldn't get people to pull over. And that was a danger to him because on the sides of the roads and all the vehicles, there were people in military outfits with weapons all staring at him and his officers so that, um, or looking at them. And that made them very intimidated. Um, once again, earlier testimony and all the other testimony from this trial and previous trial is that not everyone was in military camo gear. In fact, most people weren't. So he's testifying that most people were. Um, he gets to the northbound and points out Todd. He noticed him because he had a gun and he comes up to him and has a conversation and tells him about people with rifles aiming them at him. So Todd is telling Serena this. Then another person shows up. That's Ricky Loveling. Um, immediately Todd stops talking to him after he shows up. He was concerned about the men because they were both heavily armed and not very friendly. Okay, so there's two different things. First, that testimony matches with the testimony from the last trial up until the point where he says they were not very friendly. He stated that Todd was very helpful for him the entire time, that he was talking to, talkative to him up until the point where Ricky came up on the bridge. Now, he's, he didn't elaborate on why that changed. Maybe the situation down in the wash was changing. Um, then he says that Todd stuck his rifle bearer over the barrier and started pointing it into the wash. And then he, he makes excuses for why his back was pointed at any time to the Todd and the other and then people on this side because they really uh, attacked his testimony in the first trial based on where he was facing and how he could see if um, he was so concerned about these people, why he would put his back to them. Then he was said that he only had six to seven Nevada Highway Patrol and another group of six to seven. So roughly only 14 to 16. And they were outnumbered by hundreds. Here we go, play on words again. We have already established in the courtroom it was two to three hundreds. Um, one of the officers, the, sh the sheriff said that he would need 500 officers to control the crowd that they've already said is two to three hundred people. And now this guy says hundreds, hundred, you know, they were outnumbered by hundreds. And that it was not a safe environment for the day. Tanasi, we go into cross-examination. Says that you were set, uh, sent to set up a K-roll to assist the BLM. Um, but you were never asked to assist in the cattle roundup. You were never asked to assist in the transportation of the cattle or the selling of the cattle. So why are they all of a sudden being asked for the K-Rail setup? Um, and then he's brought up the fact that he made a report two days later where he said he had a fear of accidental discharge. Not of these gentlemen um, pointing and shooting weapons, but accidental discharge. And if that happened, it could set the whole event off. Then he was asked, were the BLM there? His answer, I, I do not recall. How, or how many? He said, yes, there was BLM. How many? I don't recall. Um, were National Park Service there? I don't recall. Um, was FBI there? I don't know. Was SWAT there? I don't know. How many Metro officers did you see? 10 to 12. Once again, what do we have? People who are already uh, trained to say, if you don't want to answer the question, I don't recall. I don't know is a perfectly good answer. We all know this from Dan Love. Dan Love's uh, famous saying, if you don't want to answer the question, I don't recall is a perfectly, absolutely good uh, answer. So we go into cross-examination. We have been objected to pretty much all the way through this cross-examination. They are really trying to hide this information. Um, Perez gets the pictures up and asks if you can show you where the bridge starts. He points out the fact that Todd Engel and Ricky Loveland aren't even on the bridge and they are maybe 50 feet from the bridge. So uh, that, that's pretty huge. He also shows that um, Ricky's drinking water. He's sitting on the barrier for a long amount of time. Marchese gets up. He shows Rick's truck and, and asks about the guys in military clothing because he, he shows Ricky's truck that we know to have Stephen Stewart and Scott Drexler in the back. Neither one of them are wearing military clothing, but this gentleman 
He testifies that they are wearing military clothing. He says they have BDUs on, which means cargo pants is the way he got through that, and boots, and that's military clothing. Um, then he goes into individuals pointing weapons at the officer. Immediately there was a sidebar, it was objected to, it was sustained, and we don't know where he was going with that. He comes back in about the conversation between him and Todd and the fact that it had stopped. Then he brings up, once again on the video, he's done this twice now, uh, he did it with the previous gentleman, the Park Service guy, um, and his pictures. He points out there's a white truck pulling something. There's another truck behind it. He points out probably five different vehicles, and he gives you a timeline based on the photos for those five vehicles and how far they're moving along through traffic. He does the exact same thing, linking those same five vehicles into the dash cam footage from Serena, sh showing that they're proving to me that there was not people pointing weapons on that bridge when Sar Sergeant Serena started his way from the Wapa Valley uh, station. So once again, there's multiple ways to prove that that is perjury. Um, so he did a really good job. He talked about the fact that when Todd walked up to him, he asked if he was pointing his weapon over the barrier. He said he was, and that he immediately asked him what was going on, and that's when he pulled his weapon back down. He has not gotten through all of his uh, cross-examination. So once again, we will come back to um, that tomorrow morning. We had to leave a little bit early because... Uh, if he doesn't check into the emergency yeah, room. Yeah, if he doesn't check into the emergency room tonight and, and not available for more cross-examination. You know, some of the things that um, like people <laughs> like people um, always say when they're coming down is they say things like, well, you know, I always knew you didn't exaggerate, but when you go up into the courtroom, re you really get to see it for yourself. So what I would like to do now is I'd like to invite a few people that are here that witnessed it in the courtroom today and maybe give their um, insight on what they saw. So first, I'm going to ask Anthony. Anthony DeFew is here from the Idaho Political Prisoners Foundation. How you doing? I think it's interesting that Gloria Navarro is able to help the prosecution by asking clarifying questions to jurors. I didn't see that in the last trial when we were here. Uh, that's definitely new, along with the juror questions, but I think that that can play evenly into both sides. Uh, there's definitely a juror that's awake. There's at least one juror that is very, very awake and in tune with what's going on. Uh, that juror is asking questions several levels deep. Um, it, that, that's encouraging. Uh, it, that's very, that's very promising. That at least there's somebody that's um, able to think for themselves and able to look at this and see that there is a bigger picture and they're trying to get to the bottom of it. Uh, I do want to bring up something that uh, Rich Tanasi did today. Uh, that's Stephen Stewart's lawyer. He introduced three elements of case law that show that in certain circumstances it is absolutely appropriate for circumstantial evidence to be admitted to someone's state of mind. Now, Gloria Navarro said, well, was that for the government to introduce circumstantial evidence or for a defendant? And he said in all three cases, it was where the government was allowed to introduce circumstantial evidence to talk about the state of mind of somebody who is the defendant. The problem with this is that for the government to be able to introduce circumstantial evidence to talk to the state of mind of these defendants uh, through, through some wrangling uh, and some collusion with the government and the judiciary, these defendants are not allowed to introduce circumstantial evidence to talk to their state of mind. So an example of circumstantial evidence would be the governor of Nevada saying what is happening in Bunkerville is absolutely offensive. That would be circumstantial evidence that the defendants would say that was reason why I came to Bunkerville to protest. One of the reasons why, including the free speech zones and all the other reasons that these men got off their couch and came to protest. So in order for these men to enter their state of mind, because the government has wrangled uh, in such a fashion that anything to state of mind is probably a veiled attempt at jury nullification. So what happens here is the government can introduce all the circumstantial evidence they want to say, these are a bunch of violent terrorists, they're a bunch of violent extremists. These men cannot turn around and introduce circumstantial evidence to say, I'm nothing of the sort, I'm just a protester. The only way that they can do this is to take the stand in their own defense and it opens them up to cross-examination. And interestingly enough, when it came down to jury selection and the peremptory strikes, it was the government that brought up a case out of Kentucky called Batson. It was um, either Batson yeah, versus Kentucky Florida. or USA yeah. versus Batson. I, it, the name is Batson. And in that case, the government was racially profiling jurors. They were removing jurors based on race 
and it was the government that did this. Uh, the government brought up Batson when the defense attorneys excused uh, eight male jurors and eight female jurors. Split right down the middle, the government cited Batson uh, as a case to say that they were gender profiling uh, the jury. So when it suits the government, they're able to bring up a case, Batson, which related specifically to government, uh, specifically to the government uh, profiling jurors, and they were able to turn around and use that against defense attorneys. But when it comes time for defense attorneys to need to be able to introduce circumstantial evidence, they are absolutely not able to do it. Uh, this gentleman's testimony, I wasn't there the last time that he was in trial, but from everything that we heard consistently, people are saying this man uh, sang the praises of Todd Engel that Todd Engel was a man who stood there, he had no issues, he was helpful, they slapped him on the back and shook his hand when he left, and today it's not the case. Today Todd was hostile, today he wasn't very nice, today he pointed a weapon over a bridge, uh, over a barrier, and that's it's fundamentally different than uh, the testimony that he gave allegedly the last time. So we're going to have to get some transcripts, we're going to have to look at it, and we're going to show you point by point that this guy's testimony is not consistent as it deals with these defendants. We've got... Uh, Thank you, Anthony. Um, once again, that was Anthony DeFue from the Idaho Political Prisoners Foundation. And um, if you haven't checked out their website, there it's a great place to go to see the motions. They, they post the motions that are filed. Um, if you want to see the motion that is posted, the 20-page motion that is preventing them from uh, getting their defense, you can go to the Idaho Political Prisoners Foundation.org, and it is on that website. We also have Josh Gibbons here from the Idaho Political Prisoners Foundation that's going to talk about what he saw today. You know, really, I think everything's been covered, but there's really one thing I want to drill home. For Officer Shannon Serena, he stated that he rushed there and his mission changed, if you will. His mission changed to, we have officers who are having guns pointed at them. And the thing I really want to drill home with this is, when he got there on video, instead of being concerned about his brothers, he directed traffic. If this was really a volatile situation that was escalating, why did they continue to let traffic go through? Any, any responsible person who's not even involved in uh, policing or anything like that would understand that if this is going to be an escalated situation, we need to stop traffic. We need to make sure that we get the people who are on the bridge off the bridge and keep it safe for everybody. That was not the case. So just remember, there is that million dollar question. If it was an escalated situation where officers have those guns pointed at them, why are you directing traffic? That's really all I've got that I can add to it at this point. But just really think about that for a minute. And, and on, the heels of what, on the heels of what Josh is saying here, if you sit in this courtroom and you listen to the testimony of these individuals, they are absolutely criminalizing the Second Amendment. This man comes and he says, I, I drove down the middle lane and there were people everywhere with assault rifles. And to this day, I, I'm just rattled by what I did. And they had assault rifles and they were pointing at people. No, everybody there was lawfully armed. There was not a single citizen there that was not lawfully armed. They were there protesting. They only went over to that bridge because someone said they're going to shoot a bunch of protesters. People went to see what was going on. These police officers, they are scared of the Second Amendment. They are scared of people exercising their rights. And they are demonizing uh, individuals who show up specifically for the purpose of protesting. We've been saying for over a year that this is a constitutional watershed. It absolutely is because the people that are supposed to secure the blessings of liberty the elements of government that are supposed to secure our rights are the ones in this courtroom today testifying that the exercise of those rights is scary and it causes them to have fear. And, it, and it's absolutely, it is fundamentally wrong. And for, for anyone not to take interest in this, this is absolutely an assault on our right to exercise those rights, which are guaranteed, which are guaranteed by the Constitution. It's their job to protect those rights. And they don't. When they get up in a courtroom before a jury, they are criminalizing the exercise of our rights. All right. So we also have Sherry Duvall here from Readout News. I'm going to give it over to Sherry to let her um, tell you what she thought about court today. I only have a short update. I was asked to come down, and one of the first things I was asked to do was to find out how exaggerated some of these reports are. And I can tell you they're not exaggerated. This uh, trial is an assault on the Constitution, on your civil rights. It's not about cows, not about guns, it's about your civil rights. I've seen Judge Gloria Navarro completely wipe the floor 
with your civil rights today. She has totally twisted this trial to be what it should not be. And we're going to watch the entire trial. We're going to, to tell you everything that we can tell you about it. But I got to tell you, keep track of Andrea. She's doing an awesome job. She's not exaggerating. She's trying to give you the facts, and she's doing a great job at it. Thank you so much, Sherry. All right, that's all we've got for you today. Um, please, like I said, call Nevada Highway Patrol and demand to know if it is policy for them to allow their officers to go in and, and commit perjury on the court. Commit perjury on we the people of the United States of America.